It is now time for question period. The member from Nepean Park. Speaker, I'm happy to hear that Jim Bradley will no longer be able to bring his Polaroid camera onto the floor of this assembly. <laughs> uh, my question is, is for the Premier. Uh, Premier, the members for Perry Sound, Muskoka, North Bay and Kenora Rainy River have all demanded action to save the pulp mill in Fort Francis. Even the Minister of Natural Resources grudgingly admitted, quote, timelines are tight and we need to ensure the building is heated. 200 direct northern jobs are at stake and another 800 indirect. Yet the government remains complacent, unable or unwilling to secure employment and opportunity for Fort Francis. Given the government floundered on the sale of the mill to Expera, will the Premier commit today that she will instruct her minister to find a way to heat the mill this winter? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I know that the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry will want to uh, comment on the supplementary, but I will just say to the member opposite, I think it is laudable that she is taking an interest in a northern Why, issue, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Because I, you know, as we have always said, this is one Ontario, and it's very important that everyone in this house understand that. And we have been engaged, as the minister has said repeatedly in question period. We have been engaged on this file from the beginning. We are in conversation. The minister has been in conversation with the uh, the owner of the mill, and uh, we are doing everything in our power, Mr. Speaker. If there is a deal to be had, but these are private sector entities who have to deal with market realities and deal with each other. Other, but we are doing everything in our power, Mr. Speaker, to stay engaged and, if there is a resolution, to help to facilitate that. What I heard there, Speaker, is that she and her minister do not understand the importance of 200 local, well-paying jobs in remote and rural Ontario. But I can assure her of one thing. The Progressive Conservative Caucus does understand that. We understand a good job is a good opportunity. We also understand that in Fort Francis, to create this, gover this investment, the opportunity that the order. government must have today, not grandstand with blustery bravado as the minister has done in the Assembly. We know that he heating the mill this winter would extend the timeline for Resolute Forest products to sell the mill. Will the Premier and her caucus put as much time into Fort Francis's crisis as they've just done on her recent trip to China? Mr. Speaker, this is a very serious issue, and the economy in the north is a very serious issue. It's why, Mr. Speaker, I have made it my business to travel repeatedly to the north to meet with companies and, and municipal leaders in the north, Mr. Speaker. It's extremely important to me that I was part of the Northern debate and that I gave people in the North the opportunity to inter interact with me. And that was not the first time I had been in the North, Mr. Speaker. So the, the fact is that we have taken this issue very seriously. And it's why, Mr. Speaker, in our platform, we made it clear, and in our practice, we have made it clear that partnering with business, working with business, is a fundamental part of the Thank you. trajectory for economic success in this province. Thank you. Again, I heard no response to the people of Fort Francis that you're taking their concerns seriously. Premier, I grew up in a small town in New Glasgow, Nova Scotia, where the pulp and paper mill was one of a handful of steady employers. So I understand more than anybody that an industry like this could be the bread and butter of the local economy. It can mean prosperity in good times and paucity in bad. I'm asking the Premier to think of Fort Francis, the mothers and fathers who want to work, their kids who want to go to post-secondary education, and the municipality who is right now worried what a negative spin-off effect this is going to have if this mill is closed for good. Think of them and act now. I finally ask you one more time, will the Premier waste no more time and move today to save Fort Francis's pulp and paper mill so that Question. there will be good jobs that go with that? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Listen, to the member, I mean, maybe if during the election uh, you or your leader or your party had gone north of Barrie, somebody would be taking you seriously. Shown up that we will be taking this seriously. 
I guess, Speaker, if I wanted to speculate today as to why this particular member is asking this particular question, we could all have a little fun here this afternoon or this morning, but it is a very serious issue. You know, just a month ago, the member from Perry Sound was in Thunder Bay complaining about money that we had contributed to private sector businesses, calling it picking winners and losers, calling it corporate welfare. Well, maybe the next time the member stands up today in the legislature and asks a question about this particular enterprise and this particular business-to-business -business relationship, she can explain why this one isn't picking winners and losers, and she can explain why this one isn't Thank corporate you. welfare. New question? The member from the Fiat Party. I, I dare say the minister should stop talking about losers, but my question goes back to the Premier. On September 16th, U.S. Steel officially filed for bankruptcy. The plant permanently shut down back in minister of Agriculture, come to order. ending more than a century of steel production at the Hamilton plant. For years, Ontario Steel was the staple of building modern cities and supporting a number of key Ontario industries, including the automotive, energy, construction and mining sectors. But under 10 years of liberal mismanagement in the energy sector and uncompetitive tax regimes, giants of industry have fled and been driven out of Ontario as a result of the loss of thousands of direct and indirect uh, industry steel industry jobs. Can the Premier explain how her government can claim economic growth on the one hand, while in fact the evidence on the other is clear that her Question. policies are driving jobs and prosperity out of Ontario? Thank you. Thank you. So, Mr. Speaker, I know that the Minister of Economic uh, Development and Employment and Infrastructure is going to want to speak to this on the uh, supplementary, but let me just, let me just uh, put a, a couple of numbers on the table. The unemployment rate in Ontario is 6.5 per cent. That is the lowest rate since 2008, Mr. Speaker. So, that's one number. The other number I want to put on the table is more than 500,000 net new jobs, Mr. Speaker, since the economic downturn. So the reality is that the economic plan that we have been acting on and that we have put in place, the investment in infrastructure, the partnering with businesses, Mr. Speaker, the understanding that our economy is changing, that industry is changing, so the investment in the talent and skills that our young people are going to need for the future, Mr. Speaker, the recognition that support Supporting our Answer. education sector and helping it to link better with the labour market. Those are the pillars of our economic plan, Mr. Speaker, and they are Thank working you. as we go through this transition in Ontario. Supplementary. Look, I understand that the Liberals are ex uh, supposedly excited about bringing 80 new steel manufacturing jobs from China, but this is a Liberal government that has missed crucial opportunities, not only in Ontario but in the rest of Canada, to promote hundreds of jobs right here. Let's take, for example, the Alberta oil sands. They need a considerable amount of steel products. Companies working in the oil sands import around. Excuse me, stop the clock. The Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs is warned. The member from uh, Halliburton, Cortha Lakes Brock, has been told now. No. No. Just let me do mine. Please finish. Companies working in the oil sands import around $5.6 billion annually in manufactured goods, but illegally dumped and subsidized imports from countries like China are being used instead of Ontario steel, which has hurt key regions in Ontario, including Hamilton and including the North. So my question is, why does the government continue to stifle Ontario manufacturing and import jobs overseas rather than working to stimulate our economy right here in question. Ontario? Thank you. Minister of Economic Mr. Speaker, the Ontario steel industry's GDP is up 38 per cent since the, the recessionary low in 2009. But this is a sector, Mr. Speaker, that globally is having some serious challenges, and Ontario can't remove itself from the global uh, challenges with regard to the steel industry. What we can do, Mr. Speaker, is keep investing in the things that are important to help the steel sector. For instance, Mr. Speaker, the auto sector. Uh, Investments that you call corporate welfare, Mr. Speaker. We call strong investments to build a supply chain in this province. We're seeing record sales right now in auto, Mr. Speaker. 
If they had their way, we would have abandoned the auto sector, and those opportunities wouldn't be there. Let me give you another example, Mr. Speaker. The wind turbine production that's taken place across this province, a huge boost yes, for our steel sector in this province. Those are the kind of investments that are supporting the steel sector. Those are the kind of investments that the party opposite has rejected. Thank you. The uh, final supplementary. The typical of, uh, of that minister, uh, it is rhetoric over uh, reality every single time. We are continuing to lose good and well-paying manufacturing jobs and Canadian jobs in the steel production industry because of illegally dumped imports and an uncompetitive business climate. There are major opportunities out there. We are the fourth largest market in the world. We should be, un we should be embracing that. There are opportunities for Ontario Steel from Northern Ontario, Hamilton and elsewhere to contribute to projects in our province, in Alberta and in the rest of Canada, but you're making it more difficult. Can you explain to me why you would rather import steel from China than look at local opportunities here and production in Ontario? Thank you. Minister. Well, the protectionist party uh, over uh, on the opposite side has kind of changed their tune. Uh, their federal, uh, their federal uh, part cousins talk about free trade. They're talking about protectionism. We're a trading, we're a trading nation, we're a trading province, and we need to be open to trade. And we can't, we can't get away from that. But, Mr. Speaker, when she talks about an uncompetitive envi environment for investment, she's dead wrong. We're number one in North America for foreign direct investment. We've just seen an increase of 37,000. And net new jobs in this province just last month alone, Mr. Speaker. We're up over half a million net new jobs since the global recession. That's almost 200 percent in job recovery. When you compare that to the U.S., they're about 115 percent. I call that progress, Mr. Speaker. There still are more people out of work in our yes, country than we'd like, but we're going to keep investing in our people. We're going to keep investing in building a strong economy, and we're going to keep putting Ontarians back. Thank you. New question, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. The fall economic statement says that the annual auto insurance transparency and accountability expert report has been given to the Minister of Finance. Why is the Premier keeping this hidden from Ontario, Speaker? Premier. Minister of Finance. Minister of Finance. Uh, Mr. Speaker, it's not hidden. Uh, in fact, we would have received the report much sooner had we not been forced into an election, had it not been delayed. As a result, the report is now been, before us. We're having it reviewed. It'll be released very shortly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, when the Premier was worried about her political future, she promised to lead the most transparent government in Canada. She even named the auto insurance expert report the Transparency and Accountability Report. I'm sure George L. Orwell will be having a chuckle about that, Speaker. Yeah. But now she's keeping transparency reports hidden. In fact, when I asked the question, the Premier and the Minister of Finance wouldn't even admit that the transparency report even existed. Now, is the Premier going to deny the existence of the auto insurance transparency report, Speaker? Minister of Finance. Oh, Mr. Speaker, obviously the member opposite doesn't seem to understand the response that I just gave a moment ago. The fact of the matter is, the report was commissioned. We issued it, we initiated it, we anticipated it a long ago, but it didn't come because of the delays that were caused by the opposition, by the unfortunate resolve of an election which, for us and for the people of Ontario, was a welcome relief, Mr. Speaker, because now we've got a majority enabling us to act quickly on the issue of uh, reducing auto insurance rates. The report will be released momentarily. It's before us. It's being reviewed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Speaker, apparently, apparently, the secret transparency report on auto insurance shows that the Liberals claim that they'd cut auto insurance rates by 8 per cent, and now the Liberals are keeping the report hidden from the public. What other embarrassing details, Speaker, are in the report that the government is so interested in keeping hidden? Thank you. Minister Finance. One more time. So, Mr. Speaker, maybe uh, the member opposite can revise her questioning as opposed to looking at the script and maybe listening to the answer. The report is before us. It's being reviewed. It'll be released momentarily in time. Let's get it done. But we need it is time to review it. Had it been not for the delays made by the opposition, 
And frankly, they have, and they have actually voted down the very measures necessary to reduce auto insurance rates. So it looks like we're going to have to do this without their help, Mr. Speaker. It'll be released shortly, and it'll be before the House. And it's Thank, you. New question, leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. Let's hope the report's original and not cleansed by the Liberal Party. My next question is uh, my next question is to the Premier Speaker. People are wondering how they can actually trust this Premier. On April 20, 2014, the Premier said, and I quote, we won't cut education. But education uh, consultation documents say that the Premier's plan uh, is to cut $500 million from education. Why is the Premier breaking the promise she made to Ontarians just seven months ago? Uh, besides the election being over, Speaker, what else has changed? Yeah. So, Mr. Speaker, I know that the uh, Minister of Education will uh, will want to uh, speak to the specifics, but um, the fact is that education funding continues to go up under this government, Mr. Speaker. Um, the reality is that uh, we have a very strong record in terms of increasing education, but also supporting the publicly funded education uh, of our students, Mr. Speaker, and we will continue to do that. Uh, the nine-page platform that the NDP put out actually had a six hundred million dollar a year cut, Mr. Speaker, that would have had to take more funding out of education than, uh, than uh, the, uh, the member opposite has uh, frankly admitted. So the reality is we continue to put more money in edu education. We continue to support the publicly funded education system, Mr. Speaker. That is, that is part of the DNA of this government. We will continue to do that work, Mr. Speaker. Well, Speaker, the Premier went on the campaign trail saying, she wouldn't cut education. But here she is, cutting education, leaving students behind. The Premier seems to be in denial, Speaker. I call cutting $500 million out of education an education cut. What does the Premier call it? Minister of Education. Premier, Minister of education. Yes, thank you very much, Speaker. And I, I think what we do need to recognize is that this is a province where we have less children than we used to have. And we need to have savings in the education system to uh, account for the fact that we have less kids than we used to. But that doesn't change the fact that we continue to increase the funding for education. We have invested this year $22.5 billion in education. That's a 56.5 percent increase since 2003. The it. funding for each and every child in Ontario's education system has gone up over $4,000 per child speaker wow. since we took time. So yes, we do have have the demographic reality Answer. that not even the opposition can change, that the average family today has 1.1 children. They use four or five children. Thank the you. opposition leader. Final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, pre-election, the Premier said she wouldn't cut education. Uh, Post-election, the Liberal government slashing $500 million from education. Pre-election, she said auto rates had come down by 8%. Post-election, we see that they haven't, Speaker. Pre-election, she said she wouldn't sell off assets. Post-election, uh, she's planning to sell off local hydro utilities, Speaker. Pre-election, she said Ontarians would get answers on the gas plants. Post-election, she's protecting key witnesses. Pre-election, she promised that child poverty would be reduced by 25 per cent. Post-election, Speaker, the government hasn't even come close. It's been five months since the election, Speaker, and that's five broken promises by this Premier. So I ask her again, what has changed except that the election is over? Question. Thank you. Minister of Education. Yes, thank you. And unlike the party opposite, we understand that this is about finding savings. We actually think that what we want to do is fund the children who are in our school system, not fund empty seats. Speaker, do you know that we are currently spending about $1 billion on empty seats? Order, please. We think that there's some efficiencies and savings there. And in fact, our school board partners agree. They have done things like amalgamate back office to get savings from joint back office. They've amalgamated transportation. They're sharing school space. We think that that's a great use of school space, is to have two boards come and share one school. That's the sort of efficiency 
that Answer. we believe our school system can have and still have a wonderful education system, which Second is fully minute. funded for students, not seats. New question, the member from Bethlehem Caledon. My question is for the Attorney General. As you know, when a person is released on bail, there are conditions imposed on them, such as house arrest or limiting when they, where they can go. But if they break their bail conditions, they must return to court for further restrictions or go back to jail. There are disturbing examples, like Christopher Husbands, who's facing charges in connection with the Eaton Centre shooting while he was under house arrest. Clearly, no one was monitoring, monitoring him. Minister, how many individuals in Ontario are currently released on bail, and what happens when their bail conditions are broken? Thank you, Attorney General. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a very uh, important question and it's a very uh, unfortunate uh, situation. Uh, we, uh, when uh, someone is uh, released on bail, uh, there is some condition attached or there is no condition attached to, uh, to a person. When there is a condition attached, you know, this person needs to respect the conditions that are attached to their, their release on bail. And if they, uh, they fail to, uh, to comply with uh, the condition, then uh, they, uh, they will be uh, back into uh, jail. So uh, it, it's, uh, but I know that there is uh, some concern about the, uh, the bail system, and uh, we're told that there's too uh, many yes, people sir. that have that have many conditions attached to their bail, so there is a committee that was put together by my ministry to re review the Thank bail you. system. Thank you. Supplementary. Minister, I'm looking for numbers. I want a quantitative idea of how many people in Ontario are out on bail with the condition. You know, you say you want to crack down on mm. underground economy, but you can't even track the criminals that are already out there. Yes, how can it be? That your ministry is not tracking this information. This is a matter of public safety. You have an obligation to follow through and make sure those who break their bail conditions are punished. Given that you've already admitted in an order paper question that you do not track this critical information, what steps will you take to ensure the people following their conditions are following their bail conditions and that the people of Ontario are safe? So the, the member is right. Uh, we do not collect statistics provincially on the number of people released on bail because I can give a number today and the number is different tomorrow. So a uh, copy of uh, bail order are provided to the appropriate police service order, and please. individual police service establish their own system and practices to monitor those who are out on bail. So the police know which accused person have been released on bail and they pay special attention the on member from Renfrew, individual. come to order. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question, the member from Hamilton, East Stony Thank Creek. you, Speaker. My question is to the uh, Minister for Pan Am, Parapan Gay. Um, speaker, we know that despite the government's mantra that everything is on budget and on time, that many of the construction projects for the Pan Parrot Games are behind schedule. How far behind? Well, that information is going to cost you. Speaker, I suppose when you're the government and you stage the most expensive multi-sports game in Canadian history and the costs keep going up, we shouldn't be surprised when they demand over $4,000 from Canada's most widely read newspaper to release documents about just how far behind they really are on these venues. Speaker, will this government dispense with the outrageous fee requests and tell Ontarians the real status of the 10 new sports facilities under construction, information asked for by the Toronto Star, and any delays that are involved. Thank you. The Minister of Tourism, Culture, Sport, and responsible for the Pan Am Pair Pan Games. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'd like to thank the member for the, uh, the important question today. Uh, these are the most open and transparent games in the history of this country, and in fact, if you look at multi-sporting games internationally, these are the most open and transparent games uh, that have ever come forward. 
And we know that 2015 is working uh, with the request to refine the scope of the FOI uh, to reduce the cost. But I think it's important to understand, Mr. Speaker, that this process is an independent process. Uh, it's impartial and it's conducted by the public service. And in fact, Mr. Speaker, it's consistent with all other provinces. And it's the same process that was in place when the Conservatives were in power, and it's the same process that's been in place when the NDP was in power. Thank you. Wow. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Speaker, the government has not released this information to the members of this House and, and not to the Toronto Star and to all Ontarians without a price. Game organizers in this electronic era say they cannot provide the requested information on a disc, something routinely done by other ministries and agencies at all levels of this government. These games organizations ultimately report to the minister and his ministry on how to provide electronic information. So, Speaker. Will this minister and the government either require Pan Para Pan Games organizers to release the information right now or have the ministry obtain them immediately to release the requested information to the Ontario public? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, again, these games are the most open and transparent games ever brought forward in the history of this, uh, this province, in the history of this country. And uh, we made sure that TL 2015 was brought under the FOI legislation. And it's the first time that any, uh, any of the games have been brought under this legislation. The TL 2015 is fully complied with the FOI regulations, and uh, again, it's consistent with all other jurisdictions across this country. There's 6,000 pages that have been requested. We're working. Uh, TL 2015 is working with the requester to ensure that information can be brought forward uh, that is cost-effective, and uh, they'll continue to work with them. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Can you question the member from Trinity East, but I. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Transportation. As a proud member of Tunis Spadina, I know how much my constituents care about public transit. It was, in fact, the most concerning issue in my riding during the last provincial election. The constituents use transit to get to work, to school in the morning, and then to home, to their family and friends at the end of the day. And they want me to make sure that our government is doing everything we can to help keep public transit both safe and efficient. I'm proud to have one of Canada's busiest transport, transportation hubs, Union Station, in, uh, in my riding. As many people in my cons con constituency use this hub to move around the city and the region. Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister. I hear a few weeks ago there were some improvements to uh, be made to the signal signaling system at Union Station. Could the minister provide the House with some more information on those two improvements. Mr. Transportation. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Trinity Spadina for that, uh, not only for the question, Speaker, but also for his continued advocacy on behalf of those that he represents so well in this legislature. That member is correct, Speaker. Two weeks ago, I was very happy to announce that our government is working to make transit more efficient for commuters in and around the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area. We will be making improvements to the entire signaling system within the Union Station Rail Corridor. These improvements will uh, ultimately enhance service reliability, eliminate track bottlenecks, increase train speeds, and reduce operating costs. Work on this project will begin in 2015 and is, and is expected to be completed by 2019. Mr. Speaker, decisive actions like this help ensure that we are making it easier for transit riders to make seamless connections when traveling, and it also ensures that we're prepared ahead of time for yes, the anticipated sir. doubling of transit ridership over the next 20 years. Thank you, supplementary. Thank you. I want to thank the minister for his response. I know my constituents will be very happy to hear about these great improvements. Mr. Speaker, I recently heard announcement by our government alongside with Metrolinx and Ivanhoe Cambridge to further the redevelopment of Union Station by connecting it to a new downtown GO bus terminal. This is a very exciting announcement, as this development will provide more travel options to my constituents throughout G and throughout GTHA. Mr. Speaker, can the minister tell the House what implications these new bus terminals will have for commuters both in my riding and around GTHA? Thank you, Minister. Thanks very much, Speaker. And again, I want to thank the member from Trinity Spadina for that question. I am very proud to be a member of a government that actually invests in public transit, Speaker. And I can say that there are so many tangible examples to prove this fact. The member is right, Speaker. This September, I was pleased to announce that Metrolinx will be partnering with Ivanhoe Cambridge to build a new downtown GO bus terminal at 45 Bay Street. 
This new terminal speaker will provide commuters with better convenience and choice by having intercity bus carriers go via rail, TTC and the UP Express all at one central location. This terminal will also welcome Go Transit's fleet of environmentally friendly double-decker buses to downtown Toronto. Construction of the terminal is expected to start in the spring of 2015 and will take approximately three years to complete. Speaker, projects like these are an ec excellent example of what can happen yes, when we work together with our private and public sector partners to invest in our communities. And thanks to the advocacy of that member and others on Thank this you. side of the House, we're getting the job done. Thanks very much. Speaker. No question. The member from Lee well, thanks very much, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. A month ago, I introduced my private member's bill to bring more transparency and accountability to the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario. Since then, I've heard from people across our province. Their stories of running into the wall of silence as CPSO close ranks, foiling attempts to get answers after the death of a loved one are heartbreaking. But they've convinced me something needs to change. But the reality is 3% of private members' bills introduced here have received royal assent since 1975. Minister, do you agree that the current complaints reporting system is broken? And will you work with me on my reasonable reforms in my bill to make some changes at CPSO? Thank you, Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Of course, I'm always happy to uh, work with my esteemed colleague from across uh, the other side. And, uh, but I want to point out, Mr. Speaker, that uh, we've already made and are making important changes in terms of uh, transparency and accountability and oversight uh, for all of our regulatory bodies, including the CPSO. In fact, Mr. Speaker, just uh, several weeks ago, I wrote uh, to all of the regulatory bodies that have a role to play in oversight uh, in the healthcare sector, asking them to incorporate additional transparency measures uh, in their business plans, Mr. Speaker, to report back to me, to the ministry, by December 1st with regards to the specific uh, activities that they will undertake on a go-forward basis with regards to uh, further transparency and accountability. I believe it's good for the colleges, it's certainly good for our health sector, and it's good for Ontario, Mr. Speaker. Thanks very much, Speaker. Back to the minister. Minister, I know you're a doctor, but I think we have to acknowledge that the system is broken and you have the authority to fix it. Media reports indicate that just 2 percent of the 2,294 complaints investigated by CPSO last year were publicly available. What about the other 98 percent? Shouldn't the veil of secrecy be lifted from those investigations? Only you have the power to give Ontarians the information that CPSO won't do voluntarily. The buck stops with you. My question is, are you going to stand up with patience and transparency? Or are you going to close ranks with fellow doctors and the CPSO? Minister. Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm not sure if the member opposite actually was listening to the first uh, response that I made to the question that we are taking action, Mr. Speaker. And, and uh, you know, I think it goes without saying that uh, my top priority and the priority of this government is the health and safety and well-being of all Ontarians, Mr. Speaker. The mandate of the CPSO, of the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario, as with all regulatory bodies in the health sector, is that same objective, the health, safety, protection of Ontarians. And I know that the CPSO and the other bodies are working diligently towards that object, Mr. Speaker. But we are not uh, standing still on this issue whatsoever, that uh, we have taken a number of measures that I articulated in the first uh, part of my answer. Transparency is of utmost importance. It makes for a better health care system, an informed uh, patient uh, in answer. Ontario. Uh, Ontarian is important in terms of uh, strengthening uh, the quality of care that they receive, uh, and uh, it's certainly something that we well, continue to work uh, diligently on, Mr. Speaker. Your question, the member from Nickel Belt. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question est également. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and uh, Long-Term Care. My private member's bill to prevent the sale of flavored cigarello passed. You know about this very well. We co-sponsored this. But to tobacco company worked overtime to find loopholes in the law. The tobacco company's unwillingness to cooperate motivated the Big Tobacco Lies campaign from the youth group of the Cancer Society, and they are here with us today. Last year, your government said they wanted to ban flavored tobacco. 
I've reintroduced the bill to ban flavored tobacco products. My question is simple. Will you support the bill? Thank you, Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. To the Associate Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care. Associate Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank the member opposite for the question. And I also want to thank her for coming out today as she was there out with me and a number of other MPPs. And we had a great tug of war uh, organized by the Canadian Cancer Society. On the one side, we had flavored tobacco, and on the other side was the good side. And uh, I'm happy to say that the good side won and the flavored tobacco <laughs> lost the tug of war. But, Speaker, it's important that we win the real war against tobacco, the real war against flavored tobacco, and the way they're trying to make inroads into our youth. So this government and I am committed to doing everything that we need to do to ensure that we make Ontario the lowest smoking jurisdiction. Thank you very much. Thank you, supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, did you know that today 57,000 youth are going to use flavored tobacco? right here in Ontario. We know that the packaging, the price, the distribution, the marketing of flavored tobacco targets young people. Flavored tobacco is most of the time the first products, products that the youth consume. Other products such as smokeless, imitations tobacco follow the exact same business model. They are meant to seem harmless but they encourage experimentation and they make sure that the next generation of smoker gets addicted. The youths are in attendance today and they want to know how much longer will we have to wait before we protect our youth and before the government acts and ban flavored tobacco in Ontario. Question. Thank you. Minister, Associate Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, uh, I really appreciate the question from the member opposite, but I do want to point out that before the election, this government introduced legislation that would have banned flavored tobacco. And if that side had supported us and not brought forward an unwarranted election by now, here, here. flavored tobacco would be banned here, here. in Ontario. Here, here. So on this side of the House, Mr. Speaker, we walk the talk. We actually do things to reduce smoking, and that is why you probably heard my announcement last week where we Member banned from Hamilton East Stony Creek, Creek come to order. And we've recommitted. We recommitted to bringing back legislation to ban flavored tobacco, uh, legislation that would have Answer. passed if you had supported us. Here, here. Thank you. Thank you. New question: The member from Ottawa remains. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Education. The safety of our children is something we and I take very seriously. Since 2003, this government has prioritized childcare and early childcare education. We know it's important to families that they have access to safe and modern childcare in order to make sure our kids get the best possible start. This is why we've introduced Bill 10, the Child Care Modernizing Act. I know that when you hear about the four deaths in unlicensed care and the call from the Ombudsman to take urgent action, that it is imperative we move fast in getting this legislation passed. That is why, Minister, I was so pleased to welcome you to Ottawa to meet with several members of the CICPO in Ottawa. Question. Minister, can you please tell us about these discussions? Minister of Education. Yes, thank you, Speaker, and I'd like to thank the uh, member from Ottawa, Orléans, for the question. Uh, last Friday, I was very pleased to, with my Ottawa colleagues, uh, to meet with a uh, number of representatives from the CICPO. Uh, that's the association representing the independent child care providers in the Ottawa area, and we had a very good discussion with them. Uh, I do take their concerns very seriously, and we had a good discussion of the issues. There will be some areas where we disagree, Speaker, but passing this bill, Bill 10, which is what we were talking about, we do need to remember that it's about the safety of our children in care and that we can't afford to delay it any further. By playing games, the opposition is delaying implementing safety measures for our children. Answer. The recently released Ombudsman report is crystal clear that if we don't make some of these fundamental Mental legislative changes to the child care Thank sector, you. we are putting children. Thank home. you. Supplementary. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister, on behalf of my colleague in Ottawa, I want to say thank you, merci, for coming to meet with members of the CICPO. The open and transparent conversation was appreciated by those in attendance. There were some constructive ideas that emerged, and I look forward to working with the, those in my own writing to make sure further progress on those ideas. However, Minister, we keep hearing irresponsible comments coming from the party opposite. They themselves are creating confusion that they say exists in the sector. But, Minister, my understanding from my colleagues on the committee is that there are many stakeholders who have expressed their support for Bill 10. Minister, can you please elaborate? Thank you, Minister. Yes, thank you. And I, and I do want to acknowledge that after the discussions in Ottawa, we were able to get back to the Ottawa members with some updated information for their constituents. But with respect to the public hearings on Bill 10, I think it's interesting to note what some of the presenters have said. For example, the Home Child Care Association of Ontario said Bill 10 represents a very important step forward to increasing the basic safety for these children. Anne Laws from the Montessori Quality Assurance said, the government of Ontario has strived to ensure the safety and well-being of young children by introducing Bill 10. And Carolyn Ferns from the Ontario Coalition for Better Child Care said, there is broad support for the many protective measures provided for in Bill 10. It is an excellent bill and we have supported Answer. it. The Atkinson Centre for Society and Child Development concluded a modernization of child care legislation is long overdue. Thank you. Speaker, uh, my question is to the Premier. Premier, will you commit to fund and implement John Tory's $15 billion Smart Track plan? Yes or no? He's a PC. Hey, hey, hey. Uh, Minister of Transportation. Uh, Minister of Transportation. Uh, thanks uh, very much, Mr. Speaker. What an interesting, fascinating, in fact, question from this particular member. And I say fascinating, Speaker, because repeatedly, week after week, this member stands up uh, and does his very best to throw cold water uh, and to suggest there are all kinds of reasons that we shouldn't move forward with building Ontario up. Speaker, I know that over the last number of weeks, and certainly going forward, this Premier, our government on transit and on transportation infrastructure projects that are so crucial to communities like Toronto, like Kitchener-Waterloo and so many others, will work, of course, Speaker, closely with all of our municipal partners. That is, Speaker, the best way to move the province forward and also the best way to make sure that as we invest the $29 billion over the next 10 years, Deputy $29 House billion Leader. that that member and his party opposed in our budget, Speaker, yeah, yeah. that we'll get the job done right. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Such a simple question. Yeah. A simple question. Where's the money? John Tory won a mandate for his seven-year smart track plan last month. In fact, the clock is already ticking, and it's your responsibility to ensure that concurrent plans using our tracks and tax dollars make sense. Now that order. the finance minister has admitted to a Member from Trinity Spadina, come to billion order. Dollar hole in your tax and spend barrel, major financial commitments like the $15 billion you will use for GTA transit plans must have stable funding, in fact, to move forward. We already know you plan to tax us with hot lanes and gas tax for transit, but can you commit today that the $15 billion announced for GTA Transit will not mean other new and increased taxes for Ontarians? Thank you. Minister Transportation. Thanks very much, uh, Speaker, and I want to thank the member for that supplementary question that kind of went uh, all over the place. I think what's really important to remember, Speaker, for that member in particular, given that he re represents the wonderful community of Kitchener-Waterloo, is that we actually have a plan, Speaker, to move his community forward, to build the province up. We plan and will, in fact, Speaker, deliver over the next 10 years on two-way, all-day go service, regional express rail, Speaker, which will provide the people of his community with the extraordinary opportunity to take the go, transit, uh, the go train service, Speaker. That is part of our $29 billion plan over the next 10 years, Speaker, to build the province up. We will work closely with Mayor Tory, Mayor Elect Tory. We'll work closely with mayors from his community, mayors right across the province of Ontario. The to member from Kitchener Waterloo comes and I to order. I hope, Speaker, that that member and his party will belatedly get on board with our plan to move the Prince province forward. It's never too to late, order. Speaker, for that member and his party to do the right thing. Thanks very much. The member from Stormont, Dundas, and South Glengarry, come to order.
The question, the member from Welland. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. When the Premier ran for the leadership, she promised 1.8 million Ontarians with disabilities that she would make Ontario fully accessible by 2025. During the election, the Premier promised to instruct all ministers on their duties to meet that promise. But the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Alliance reviewed her mandate letters, and they were shocked by the silence on full accessibility. Why did the Premier say one thing during the election and break her promise to persons with disabilities now? Let me just, uh, I know that the Minister of Economic Development and uh, Employment and Infrastructure is going to want to speak to this because the, uh, the issues around um, helping people with disabilities to get into the workforce and making sure that we have an accessible society is very much a part of, uh, of his mandate. And Mr. Speaker, uh, you know, I, I just want to be very clear that our commitment to making Ontario accessible is firm. The reason that the uh, accountability it rests with the Minister of Economic Development and Employment is that we know that one of the fundamental challenges for people with disabilities is accessing the labour market, becoming part of the economy, being able to use their skills and their talents. And so it's a fundamental part of the work that the Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure is doing, and I know that he will want to speak to the specifics. And I understand that that yes, the standards sir. that have been put in place are uh, are being uh, enacted and uh, yep. and being enforced, and that we have more standards that Thank we are you. going to be working on. Thank you, supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. The Premier's mandate letters give ministers their marching orders, uh, but the letter to the minister to do nothing but explore new standards. Even the former minister admitted that compliance was unacceptably low, that 70 per cent of the private sector companies with 20-plus employees are in violation of the Act. Speaker, accessibility enforcement must be a real priority for this government. Will the Premier now issue an order to the Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure to effectively enforce the AODA Act? Thank you. Premier. Oh, sorry. Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Minister Infrastructure. Minister of Economic Development, Employment <laughs> and Infrastructure. Well, that order was issued loud and clear when the Premier gave me this file. This is not a side file for, for my ministry at all. In fact, it's, it's a, an absolute necessity, a priority. That's why we just recently appointed uh, David Onley as a special advisor on accessibility to be a champion both inside and outside of government for us because we're determined to continue to make progress. We're talking about billions of dollars of economic opportunity, Mr. Speaker, that will be there for our private sector, will be there for our taxpayers, will be there for our economy if we're able to achieve these very ambitious goals that we set out to achieve. We're the first jurisdiction in the world, Mr. Speaker, to set out in a legislative way to move forward in this way. We still have Answer. plenty of work to do. With the help of David Onley, the accessibility community and others, we're we're determined to make this Thank happen. Thank you. Question, the member from Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier in her capacity as the Minister of Intergovernmental Relations. I think this is an important question, and I know I certainly want to hear the answer to this. Premier, I understand that you have written to the Prime Minister on a number of occasions wanting to meet with him to talk about shared goals. For instance, talking about economic growth, developing safe and prosperous communities, and building a strong Ontario within Canada. There are other things to talk about, including working collaboratively with Ottawa on public infrastructure. And given the number of severe projects we have in Canada that need attending to, it would be a good idea to get together to talk about this. How about talking about the auto sector, international trade, and the reduction of trade barriers? Premier. Has the federal government been willing to meet with you to talk about these important Questions? issues? Thank you. Thank you. Premier and Minister of Intergovernmental yeah. Affairs. Thank you. And I want to uh, thank the member for the question. And as many in this House know, it's been more than 11 months since uh, I've had the opportunity to meet with Prime Minister Stephen Harper face to face. So on September 16th, Mr. Speaker, I, uh, I wrote to the Prime Minister requesting a meeting to discuss a variety of issues relating to economic growth, developing safe and prosperous communities, and building a strong Ontario within a strong Canada, because I think those things are connected. As the member mentioned, there are several areas where I think we can 
can have a more collaborative relationship, Mr. Speaker, working together to create opportunities to build more security throughout people's lives. So just yesterday, Prime Minister Harper replied, but he made no mention of my meeting request, Mr. Speaker. So that's why I've written again this morning, requesting a meeting before the end of 2014. I believe that it's a much better situation when the Prime Minister of Canada and the Answer. Premier of our country's biggest province are able to work together collaboratively, Mr. Speaker. So I look forward to hearing the Prime Minister's answer. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, thank you for that answer, Premier. I think that there are other things that we need to talk about, too. For instance, federal transfers. How about talking about our employment insurance system that really does not seem to meet the realities of our modern labour market? Uh, we are also moving on in Ontario with a provincial public pension plan that's aimed at securing better retirement for our future and for our citizens. But could we be talking with Ottawa about making sure that all Canadians coast to coast have the same? And finally, this House has called on the federal government to take action to address violence against Aboriginal women and girls. Premier, how can we work collaboratively with Ottawa? How do you do this job? Thank you, Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And you know, Mr. Speaker, I'm listening to some of the heckling on the other side. This is not a partisan issue. This is about the Prime Minister of Canada meeting with the Premier of the largest province in Canada, Mr. Speaker. And I think that working collaboratively, working collaboratively is exactly what needs to happen. Creating jobs and growth in the economy. Work together to reduce congestion so that we spend less time commuting, Mr. Speaker, and more time with our families. Building and renovating, Mr. Speaker, the schools and hospitals and roads that allow Ontarians to function, Mr. Speaker. My concern is that the current system of federal provincial fiscal arrangements is working against, not for, the people of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. And that is a discussion that needs to happen. My fear is that as the federal government has been missing in action in terms of working with the province, yes, that that would continue, and I don't think that's acceptable. So we have asked for that meeting, Mr. Speaker. I hope that we'll be able to talk Thank about you. investment in the Ring of Fire, Mr. Speaker, infrastructure, and the ways that we can collaborate. Thank you. New question, the member from Chatham, Kent, Essex. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Premier, Chatham Kent constituent of mine found an 18-inch section of a wind turbine blade on his farm while farming this spring. He found a blade on his property some 400 feet from the base of the turbine in question. I have documented proof, and I will be sending these pictures over to you for review. Fortunately, there was no damage to his property or personal injury to anyone, but this raises a very serious safety issue. Picture a 2.3 megawatt turbine with a blade length of 135 feet standing some 400 feet tall. And it should also be noted, uh, Premier, that the blade tip uh, speed rates rotate at 164 miles, miles per hour. I, along with many in my riding, are rightly concerned for the safety of residents. So, Premier, my question to you is simply this. Will your government do the right thing? Question. Put a moratorium on turbine developments until there is a thorough review of safety standards pertaining to industrial Thank you. wind turbines. Yeah. <laughs> Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the member for bringing that uh, particular issue to our attention. Uh, it's not something that I had been advised of previously, uh, but certainly we will take that under advisement. We look at the circumstances around this particular issue. We do have a very robust environmental assessment process moving forward, but uh, I think we have to understand. Member from Renfrew, we have come to, to order that when something like this happens, we need to look at it very, very carefully in terms of public safety. The same as uh, a, 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 a piece of metal falling off an airplane, which occasionally occurs, you try to avoid those things happening as much as possible. So I yes, take sir. your question seriously. We look into the circumstances. I will consult with my colleague, the uh, Minister of the Environment and Climate Change, uh, with respect Thank to you. environmental assessments, and we will check with our... Thank you. shouldn't have to say thank you twice. Supplementary. Speaker, well, the message from the government could very well be that public safety isn't a problem. But, Premier, recently the Transport Canada ordered GDF Suez, in my writing, to take down eight industrial wind turbines that have violated airport zoning regulations at the Chatham Municipal Airport. Premier, I've spoken with many pilots, and they all say that it's too dangerous to fly in and out of that airport 
especially when there are adverse weather conditions. These turbines pose a huge safety issue around any airport, whether it be in Chatham or even Collingwood. Literally translated Premier, an encounter with one of these imposing turbines or pieces of shrapnel will result in body bags. None of us want that. Right. Premier, safety trumps all, and I know you know that. I'm not an aerospace engineer, but I do know that shrapnel traveling at close to 200 miles per hour poses significant question. safety risk for aircraft and humans. So my question, to Premier, is this. Will your government take the initiative, since you are paying huge subsidies, and review turbine placement and provincial safety standards for turbine erection Thank you. in all of Ontario? Thank you. Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. First, I, I want to say that we take these things very seriously, and safety standards uh, have to be second to none. So I want to assure the member uh, that uh, both myself and my colleagues on this side will take it seriously. I do want to make sure we have perspective on this because uh, I know you live about two blocks from here. And I know the building next door to you had several large pieces fall off it and glass fell to the street. Uh, that was one of about seven buildings in central Toronto which that happened. That is also an equally serious, an equally serious problem. No one in the offices suggested we put a moratorium on condominium construction in Toronto because you know what the reaction would be. So, so we have to make sure that we're taking all of these, these problems seriously. We, we take this very seriously when we see glass falling out of a condo tower or when we see a piece coming Answer. off a wind turbine. But wind turbines cannot be held to a higher standard of safety than any other similar situation. And I hope that we'll get as many questions on condo towers as we'll get on Thank wind you. turbines, Mr. Speaker. New question? Member from London West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, Statistics Canada job numbers released earlier this month were bad news for London. At 7.5 per cent, London's unemployment rate is now a full percentage point higher than the Ontario average. Not only has the unemployment gap widened between London and the rest of the province, but the stats also show fewer people are working in London and fewer people are looking for work. Will the Premier admit that her jobs plan is failing to address London's economic challenges? Actually, Mr. Speaker, no, I won't do that, and I will uh, ask the Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure to speak to the supplementary. But what I will say, Mr. Speaker, is that we recognize that the economic recovery has looked different in different parts of the province. We absolutely understand that, and I know that there are people in this province who are still not able to get the jobs that they are capable of, that, uh, that businesses still need support, Mr. Speaker, and that's why we have different strategies in different parts of the province. That's why we have regional development funds, so the Southwestern Ontario Development Fund, Mr. Speaker. That's why we have taken the initiative to make sure that we understand the economy of different regions in the province. We know our work is not done, Mr. Speaker, but we also know that the direction that we're going in is exactly the one that we need to be, Mr. Speaker, that, that the economic recovery is taking hold, but not evenly in all parts of the province. Speaker, the, num the, the numbers speak for themselves. Last month, we saw 1,100 people leave the London area labour force, followed by another 200 people this month. In fact, since 2008, London has lost over 30,000 positions. Many of those leaving are young people, depleting our labour pool of the young talent needed to move our city forward. I'm glad the Premier talked about different job creation strategies. We want to know when will this government introduce strategies Strategies that actually work for London. Minister of Economic Development, Climate Minister Minister of Economic Development Trade and uh, Infrastructure. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I mean, strategies that work. Uh, members should have been paying attention when, the, when the, our finance minister made his economic statement this week, and he talked about our youth employment strategy. Mr. Speaker, there are thousands of young people in London that are getting job experiences through that 23,000 young people across this province that are. The members should pay attention to some of the programs that are going on in her community, the Southwest Ontario Development Fund. 
fund. For instance, this fund provided over $2.6 million, leveraging $30 million and creating sustaining 806 jobs in the London area, Mr. Very Speaker. Good. There are others as well. We're working very hard. We recognize some of the challenges London has had. The, uh, the unemployment rate in London has gone down, but there's still too many people out of work in that part of the province. And Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue to work really hard to bring down that unemployment rate. It's now at a record low uh, since 2008 Answer. across this province. And Mr. Speaker, I'd, I'd love to continue to talk to the member about other initiatives going on in London, but my time is running out. It sure has. <laughs> Uh, member from Scarborough Agent Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Associate Minister of Health and Long Term Care. I want to acknowledge and thank the young people in Canadian Cancer Society for organizing this morning's tug of war to raise awareness of flavor and candy tobacco products. In my riding of Scarborough Agent Court, I have many young people who are championing for smoke free Ontario. We have come a long way when we come to about smoke free Ontario. The use of tobacco remains a leading cause of preventable disease and death in Ontario. More than two million Ontarians continue to smoke and thousands of young people taking up smoking every year. Recently, I host a 10,000 coffee event in my riding of Scarborough Asian Court, Very and good. many young people continue to complain to me about the flooded market of candy and flavored tobaccos appealing to young people. Yeah. S Ms. Speaker, through you to the minister, can she please explain to us what is she doing to protect young people in Ontario? Thank you. Thank you. Associate, Associate Minister of Thank you, Speaker. And I'd like to begin by thanking the uh, member from Agent Court for her question and also thanking her for joining us at the Tug of War this morning uh, against flavored tobacco. And I completely agree with the member that uh, we, here, we here in Ontario need to do everything we can to make sure that Ontario is the lowest smoking jurisdiction. And that is why, Speaker, on uh, last week I, re I was pleased to announce new regulations to prohibit smoking on restaurant and bar patios, sport fields and around playgrounds starting January 1st. Also, as this House will recall, Last year, we brought forward legislation that, if passed, would have banned flavored tobacco products. It also would have made increased penalties for selling tobacco to kids, making them the highest in Canada, and strengthened tobacco enforcement. I have been very clear that I intend to introduce this proposed legislation. I look forward Answer. to tabling it soon and receiving the support of this House. Thank you. We have a deferred vote on the motion to second reading of Bill 8, an act to promote public sector and MPP accountability and transparency by enacting the broader Public Sector Executive Compensation Act 2014 and amending various acts. Calling the members, this will be a five-minute bell.
Would the members please take their seats? On October the 29th, Ms. Matthews moved second reading of Bill 8. All those in favour, please rise one at a time to be recognized by the clerk. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Matthews. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Madame Mayor. Madame Mayor. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Ms. Sandals. Ms. Sandals. Mr. Duguid. Mr. Duguid. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Balkasin. Mr. Balkasin. Ms. Manga. Ms. Manga. Mr. Kraft. Mr. Crack. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassy. Ms. Jassy. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Darmerlin. Ms. Darmerlin. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Ms. McMahon. Ms. McMahon. Ms. Nadu Harris. Ms. Nadu Harris. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Ms. Verniel. Ms. Verniel. Ms. Ms. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Mr. Arnott. Mr. Arnott. Mr. Hudak. Mr. Hudak. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. <laughs> Mr. Miller, Perry Sound, Muskoka. Mr. Miller, Perry Sound, Muskoka. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Mr. Urich. Mr. Urich. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Marteau. Ms. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. Mr. Pettipies. Mr. Pettipies. All those opposed, please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Chibisson. Chibisson. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Vantal. Mr. Vantal. Madame Jolina. Madame Jolina. Mr. Tabin. Mr. Tabin. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Natashak. Mr. Natashak. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Ms. Campbell. Ms. Campbell. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. Gretzky. Ms. Gretzky. Ms. French. Ms. French. The ayes being 76 and the nays being 19, I declare the motion carried. Second reading of the bill, deuxième lecture, proposal de loi. Pursuant to the order of the House dated November the 18th, the bill is ordered, uh, ordered referred to the Standing Committee on General Government. There are no further deferred votes. This House stands recess until 3 p.m. this afternoon.